Hello, everyone. It is now the time to take your seats. Uh, for those of you that are standing in the back, I just want to point out that the balcony does also have some room, so if you feel like you can't see anywhere, you can always uh, relocate to the upstairs land. And if there's anybody that's not in a reserved seat that is sitting next to a, an empty seat, will you raise your hand? There's one, two, I see. I can't see anything else because of blinding lights. But if you're not occupying a seat, go and grab one now. Um, tonight, we're here to talk about the theme of Scheme. I'm Annetta Black. I'm the curator of Odd Salon and also your curator tonight. <laughs> Hello, all you fabulous people. I'm so glad to see everyone tonight. Um, before we get started, there's a thing that we do here in the beginning, and I have a question for you. How many of you are here for the very first time? Raise your hands. Everyone else, give them a gigantic welcome and a round of applause. You have chosen wisely. This evening's lineup is terrific. I'm really, really excited about all of tonight's talks. Um, I was actually laughing out loud to myself just while I was reviewing people's slides, so I'm super excited. For those of you that are new and a refresher for everyone that is not new, this is not a quiet event. So we are going to ask you to make some noise, to give the speakers feedback, to make them feel welcome by not being quiet. And for the regulars, let's help the new people get a sense of some of the things that go on here. Yes! <laughs> Good job! All right. I would have also accepted adventure for this one, since it's the uh, map of the Antarctic um, explorations, polar explorations. So, this event is also a participatory project by design. This stage is your stage. If you have a crazy idea for a story you know this much about right now, but you'd like to get up here for 10 minutes and face the blinding speaker light, congratulations, you're qualified, and we'd love to have you on board. <laughs> Curation is now open for our next salon coming up next month. The theme of that is Epiphany. We'll have more on that at the end. We'll be brainstorming that next week officially as a group pod, but you can submit your ideas for that theme or any of our upcoming themes or even just a crackpot idea you have that doesn't yet fit, fit a theme up here at the oddsalon.com forward slash speak. Also, we are expanding beyond our community of speakers, which is how we formed in the very beginning with a community of 10 speakers, and we now have a membership. And I'd like to encourage everyone to consider joining our membership if you like what we're doing here. Uh, San Francisco is an unfathomably expensive city to do weird, arty, independent things in, and every contribution helps. We're a fiscally sponsored organization by the nonprofit organization, the Interculture Foundation, so it's all going to a good cause, um, and it is also a tax-deductible donation. We have some <laughs> wonderful... Wonderful events coming up. Uh, our fellow Casey Selden. Are you here tonight, Casey? Nope. nope. Okay, we're just going to talk about her behind her back. She has been putting together a whole roster of awesome outings for the fellows and the members. They're sort of casual mixer field trip events, and they're, they're really fun and awesome. We have some coming up that I'll share at the end of the evening. Also, you do not need to put away your phones. Please go ahead, join us on Twitter, join us on Instagram. Our hashtag is either Odd Salon or Learn Something Weird. Um, and that phrase, something weird, is also the name of our Facebook group, which is our conversational group where the speakers and the curators and all of you can come together to sort of talk about the concepts that we talk about at Odd Salon after the show and before the show and between the show. Um, and you can connect with all of us there. So I. Welcome everyone to join that and encourage you to jump into the conversation. So, to kick things off for tonight, uh, we start every evening with an invocation where we turn to other people's words to set sort of the parameters for this. And as I was thinking about scheme, scheme is a word that means a whole lot of things. And I began thinking about a game that I like to play. And there are these, they're mental games that we all play when we are on a long road trip or we're on flights or we're stuck at the DMV. And some of those things are like, I like to build imaginary houses in my mind or plot out travels, but when I want a little bit more of a challenge, I play a game that you're probably familiar with 
all about finding the connections between seemingly unrelated things. And the game that I like to play is called Six Degrees of Catherine de' Medici. <laughs> and it's amazing <laughs> how interconnected everything is. So I thought tonight I would play around and I, I, I do a little different challenge. Tonight I want to do six degrees from Machiavelli to the London Underground in six easy steps. So let's go. To begin with, how can you have an evening dedicated to scheme without invoking Machiavelli? His name is practically synonymous with this evening's theme, and it is, it is the concept of both political scheming and sort of the scheming personality type that, have, that Machiavelli has given his name to. The word Machiavellian is now a descriptor for, for those things. But of course, he was a real person. Niccolo Machiavelli was born in 1469 in Florence, and he was born in the height of the flowering of the arts and the sciences that made up the Italian Renaissance. He was also born into an era of basically unending war between the Tuscan city-states. As a young man, he taught rhetoric, which I think is important. It's the classical technique of convincing language and logic that helps you win arguments. In 1494, Florence expelled its most famous leaders, the Medici family. And in the newly founded Republic, Machiavelli took on an increasingly political role. Um, he took on a bunch of responsibility, became involved in the um, city-state wars, and particularly against those assholes from Pisa. And the reason they were so concerned with Pisa is because Pisa was upstream on the Arno River, and the Arno River was Florence's route to the ocean, and so their connection to the outside world and trade. And with all of these increasing arguments between Pisa <laughs> Job. Between Pisa and Florence, it became clear that they intended possibly to dam that river and block Florence from the ocean, which was unacceptable. So Machiavelli came up with a cunning plan. So technically, he was in charge of the plan. He might not have come up with the plan, but regardless, a plan was hatched, and this was it to divert an entire river around Pisa, therefore screwing them first. Um, this has been an entire talk at Odd Salon, so you can check that out on YouTube later if you'd like to. But basically, in a nutshell, the idea was to move the river entirely around Pisa. And Machiavelli needed a conspirator for this. He needed a technical genius, he needed an engineer, he needed a dreamer and a madman. And so he called on his friend Leonardo da Vinci, who was in town conveniently to paint a nice war mural nearby, and they set to planning. Da Vinci rode out and surveyed the land, and Machiavelli laid the plan of attack to build canals and culverts to divert the river, but all had to be done in the highest level of secrecy so that Pisa wouldn't just show up and kill them all. I'll make a long story short. It was complicated, it took a bunch of time, but after days or even months of digging with 2,000 Florentine workers, they tested their plan and they flooded their first culverts, which failed completely and then flooded a whole bunch of Florentine farmland. So that brilliant scheme was ultimately cut off. But then, to make matters worse for Machiavelli, the Medici family came roaring back into town and power in our third connection. They proceeded to try, they, to try him for treason, uh, for supporting the interim government, and he was tortured using this very inventive rope situation, and exiled from Florence. But Machiavelli had a cunning scheme to ingratiate himself back with his powerful patrons. So in 1513, he produced the first version of his famous work, The Prince, based loosely on the antics of the Borgias, but dedicated to Lorenzo de' Medici II, the most powerful man in Florence, and mother to another infamous schemer, Catherine de' Medici. See? It's so easy. The Medici family were to go on being the leaders and occasionally dramatically exiled rulers of Florence for the next several generations. And they were personally responsible for an enormous swath of the art and innovation that we connect with the Renaissance, funding an incredible breadth of projects. And among the incredible things that they did and funded, the Medici underwrote the controversial scientific work of Galileo Galilei, our fourth connection. Galileo was born in Pisa. 
but by then part of the Florentine territory in 1564. And he quickly became known in his academic circles for his extraordinarily keen scientific mind and a penchant for discovery. He was captivated by the scandalous and banned scheme of planetary motion that was described by Copernicus a decade or, or a generation earlier. But despite the evidence that he was amassing that Copernicus had been right all along, the entire subject of heliocentrism was verboten and it barred him from doing the groundbreaking science he was compelled to pursue. But Galileo had a cunning plan. He would use rational thought evidence and diagrammatical genius to prove incontrovertibly to the church and the state leaders that Copernicus had been right. It did not work. <laughs> Galileo was summoned and found guilty uh, of heresy by the Catholic Inquisition and he lived the remainder of his life under house arrest. What both Copernicus and Galileo had been engaged with in their arguments was the use of schemes. It's a word that first appeared in the mid-1500s, and it was, when it first emerged, it didn't mean the Machiavellian kind of scheme. It meant this kind of scheme. It meant the diagrams that showed how the universe worked, how mathematics worked. And schematic diagrams had existed in mathematics and practical sciences for a long time. But it wasn't until the late Renaissance that we really saw this rise of abstracted conceptual illustrations rather than, than faithful illustrations of what you could actually see, these diagram concepts that we know as schematics. Maps had always been a kind of a schematic, a way to picture an unfathomably large world. But there are a lot of different ways to imagine the world, by hemisphere, or with the Holy Land as its spiritual center, or by route for those road trips. And schematics began to blossom across discipline. Here's a color wheel from the 1700s, and another color schematic by Goethe. Fortresses were imagined in simplified schematics. Palladio's elevations and floor plans revolutionized the sharing of architectural and structural engineering information. And in the Crimean War, Florence Nightingale used a schematic to point out the causes of mor mortality in the war. Transportation systems understood the value of a simplified way of communicating routes. And schematics can even help us understand language, like the etymology of scheme, which comes from the Greek, um, and the rise and fall of the word usage, and hello, 1750. <laughs> something, something happened there, I'm not sure what. But all of these beautiful data visualizations are a kind of scheme in the cunning Machiavellian sense because schematics can reveal the hidden patterns of the world and clarify data and help us visualize difficult concepts, but they can also be used to make compelling false arguments <laughs> and to lie with valid information. Which brings me finally to the last cat in this scheme, Harry Beck, who dramatically simplified the London underground map uh, in one undertaking, managing to make the tube map easy to comprehend, beautiful, and easy to navigate, and also to have almost nothing to do with spatial reality. <laughs> the London Underground map didn't always look the way we imagine. In the early days, it was a more of a standard route map, and it was tied to the actual geography of London. But it was hard to read for some and difficult to understand. So Beck <laughs> came up with a cunning scheme. He took his inspiration from electrical diagrams. I chose this one because I'm intrigued to know what a Hokata 125 wombat might be, and if anybody knows, find me after. I'm very interested. Um, and in 1931, he produced this work of genius. And this one, this scheme was a success. Despite the way that it lies with schematics, the map was an instant sensation, and it's remained the core concept for the London Underground map ever since, and also, the basic idea behind subway maps anywhere. And it's one of the most beautiful of lies, I think. Today, the world that we live in is awash in schematics, infographics, misleading charts, and scheming graphs of all kinds. And so as we move into this evening full of schemes and plots and colors, I wanna leave you with the words of Charles McKay, who's a dude who knew a thing or two about schemes and schemers, and he wrote, Every age has its peculiar folly, 
some scheme, project, or fantasy into which it plunges, spurred on by the love of gain, the necessity of excitement, or the force of imitation. But that's not my invocation. He also said this, which I think is relevant and is tonight's invocation, and also kind of a toast. So please join me and raise your glass. And he wrote, let us not, in the pride of our superior knowledge, turn with contempt from the follies of our predecessors. The study of the errors into which great minds have fallen in the pursuit of truth can never be uninstructive. Charles McKay, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, winner of best book title, and also a really, really amazing read. And with that, I'm going to move on to everyone else. Thank you all. All right, oddlings, I can say with great confidence that you are in for a good one. Tonight's stories cover Machiavellian machinations, triumphant victories, poisonous scandals, schemes that play both to the intellect and to the base instincts. Joining us tonight, we have three Odd Salon fellows, Leonard Appleton, Laura Rubin, and Aaron Doran. They were joined by returning speakers, Lynn Rudder and Jessica Hansen. And joining us for the first time, a huge Odd Salon welcome to Nick McBride. Oh. 